my goodness, this is just an incredible crowd. Huh. I'm very, on uh, let's see, you can hear me, right? I'm very honored to be here and be able to fit the time into your schedule. You have so many exciting people that you're listening to. I hope you'll continue to be excited about this talk as well. I really want to give a thanks to Barbara for involving Yale at all in this program and particularly teaching us so much about what a young person can do to change the world, which is exactly what you are doing. One thing about Barbara is she demonstrates amazing leadership. And when I describe what I mean when I talk about leadership, I think it will make a lot of sense. And it, a large part of it involves who exactly she gets to work with her on things. So she got all of you, which is fantastic, and a wonderful staff that she has had every year. Um, this is the beginning of fantastic leadership. And what my goal today is to talk a little bit about leadership and global health because it's a, it gives us a much more complicated place. Now, I have a, it's a funny feeling for me to talk in the Branford dining room because I'm the master of this college. And if I could have known <laughs> one day that I would be standing here and global health committed youth would be in the center of Branford College about to really lead in the world, I just, I would have had to pinch myself because Yale has been a little slow to come up to where global health is. We really started in 2009. So the fact that you are sitting here in the middle uh, on the way for your journey is just a real thrill for me personally, I won't forget. So thank you for the few minutes we have together. What I'd like to do uh, is talk about leadership in global health, and I, I know you're a big group, but please interrupt me. I don't know what to do with this. Uh, the talk will be much more interesting. I don't have that many slides, and I'm happy to answer any questions about anything I've done or these concepts related to leadership. So please just raise your hand if you have a question. So here's my outline. Um, I want to just start by getting on the same page. What are some definitions of terms you hear all the time? And let's, I mean, of course, you could argue about these, but I just want to get us on the same page. And then I want to talk about a model of leadership. And last, I'd like to have some discussion, because I'd like to know your own thoughts relative to some of this. So some of the terms I want to talk about are management, leadership, public health, international health, and global health. These are terms you've probably used 100 and 150 times in the last week, even. But let's talk rigorously about what we really mean. So the first thing, management and leadership. What's really the difference? What do we really mean? Oh, this is really loud. What, what do we really mean as the difference? Anyone just want to give me? Yeah. Um, Kay, Kay Lynn? Yeah. OK, a vision versus let's execute. Yep. Anything else? You summed up 300 years of scholarship in three sentences, and no one's got anything else to say? How many of you want to do leadership for the rest of your life? How many of you want to do management for the rest of your life? Actually, you're pretty even. Usually you say that everybody wants to be a leader and nobody wants to just be the manager. I want to disabuse you of that idea and really talk about leadership as a relationship between the people who are in leadership roles and the people who are in followership roles. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But the difference that I might say here is management we might talk of as a process of achieving predetermined objectives. Someone else has said, we're going to do this. This is the vision. This is the objective. And then the management group has to actually achieve that through human, financial, and technical resources. So it is a bit, as Kaylin says, the execution. It's not really dreaming up the objectives. It's really executing on them. Like huge complexity, because it has to be done through others. So it's not management if you, if your boss says, go figure out if um, you know, our stock outs are better or worse than they were last year, and you go to your computer and run the analysis. There's no management there. You have to go to 10 other people. Some of them live in the country. Some of them are expats. You know, there's a funder, and you have to manage all of the complexity to get that answer. That's management. Leadership, in contrast, I would say, is the process 
it's still a process, but it's of engaging others to achieve group objectives. So this is different than setting a vision. And I might say that the history of what leadership means has grown over time to be more and more, less and less hierarchical, and more and more about engaging with others so that you could together achieve the group objectives. That's a lot different than setting direction, getting the vision and telling others what to do. It's much more through the relationship of engagement you will be able to achieve group objectives. And the work you are about to do is going to be this, because there is no way to accomplish something except to engage with others no matter how different and impossible that may seem to be sometimes. So that is how I would define leadership. And I just want to define these things, public health, international health, and uh, global health, because there also, I think, is an interesting history with this. You know, actually, the most famous definition of public health was um, defined by C.A. Winslow in the 1920s, and he happened to be a professor here at Yale, so I like to use this one. But defined back then that public health was the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, promoting health and efficacy, through organized efforts to enable every citizen his birthright and longevity. So what are the words that are important in there? Anything you want to just say about this definition, if it were to be today? Historical definition. What's interesting about it? Birthright. Yeah, so what do you make of that? Who's talking? Ah, what do you make of that? That it's a right. There's a human right to the beginning. You were born, you have the right to public health. Yep, very important. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, people think about public health as a science, but, you know, because you need epidemiology and maybe biology and infectious disease, but really, it's a liberal arts. It's part of liberal arts. You have to be able to use every kind of tool you can imagine to improve human health. That's a tough thing. Great. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. It's there. Is it too loud? Oh, really? Oh. Okay. Can you hear me? Is that better? No? Mm -hmm. Can you hear this? No, oh my goodness, you're talking. Okay. Hello? Can you hear me? So you have to raise your hand if you can't. That's odd. Let me try a little higher. Hello? Oh. Okay, you like that. Okay. Hello? <laughs> I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? Is it okay? It is? All right. I got an idea. Yeah, that is a good idea. Or I could just do it like this. I've got a handheld. I have a hand. Oh, all right. This is leadership at work. Here you go. Okay. Oh, yeah. Look, I, can you hear me? Okay. All right. It's weird. I got it. Okay. So you were saying about citizen. Yes, that really dates this, doesn't it? Because we would not exclude people from the right to health because they're a citizen or not. That sounds arcane, uh, archaic, I should say. And, uh, but this was written in the 20s. And, but nonetheless, there is a tension in public health has often been done by governments, you know. And governments are not really thinking, except we're going to take care of our citizens. That's my obligation. So the human rights piece of this kind of comes in conflict with the citizen here. But it's right there. Yep. Was there another comment about? Yep. Yep. It, it says preventing disease. I need to give you the mic. It says preventing disease and what?
Yes, there's no question here. He was in the, really started our School of Public Health, and it is focused on the prevention. It's not really integrating the treatment and clinical side as much as perhaps today we think of it. Yep, great. And yes. It's true that it doesn't literally say the sh social determinants of health here. However, the idea of promoting health, you would think that could, I don't know what was in his head, but that could be broad. The other issue that I think is here is it's organized efforts. Efforts. It could be anything. This isn't medicine. This isn't water. This isn't environment. It's efforts. And it's organized efforts. This is why leadership and management are fundamental tasks in public health. Because it is not about a single person going to do something. It's about organizing efforts and becoming active and activating, mobilizing the resources you have. So I always get kind of bummed when MPHs don't take that much leadership and management because who walks, who grows up to be 21 years old and all of a sudden knows how to organize efforts? That's a skill that you develop through a lot of what you're going to be doing and you of course already have had a lot of experience to get there. But that uh, I think is a fundamental piece of public health. Let me um, move now out of the 1920s into really what was about the 1970s when the words international health became sort of the you know interesting field du jour everybody who was sort of an activist about public health wanted to go into international health and largely because it became very apparent through lots of natural disasters and lots of poverty that there were enormous, enormous problems when we leave the United States from a United States perspective and go internationally to low and middle income countries that the health was really much worse than in the United States. And international health grew as a field and it was no more than the application of the principles of public health to problems that affect low and middle income countries and definitely excluded the United States. Today, still many people use the terms international health, not global health. But I just want us to get on the same page. What do you read about this that would tell you it's distinct from global health, if anything? Yeah. It's missing the high-income country is good, and it's missing the U.S. It's, it's sort of international, well, from whose perspective? It's not one globe, it's like us and them us and them. It's got a very different connotation that somehow you, you come out from where you are in a high income country and give all your gifts to a low and middle income country. So this, this field of international health was really started by physicians. It was very much physicians who were human rights people who wanted to do something about infectious disease in lower income countries than where they came from. And it flourished, although probably did not flourish um, to the degree it could have because there were not large funding mechanisms of this from the U.S. government. So this really came upon people who were, in their own hearts, this is what they wanted to do. Now, it has taken a long time to move people from the term international health to global health, but I think it's important. Um, the international health term, in fact, I, we still, dealing with the president of, the United, of uh, Yale, I frequently have to correct both he and the vice president to say, no, 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 not international health. The U.S. is in this too. Global health means something very different. So let's talk about what we really mean by global health. And I apologize if you started your sessions this way. But for me, and this comes very much from... Uh, Mike Merson and Jeff Copeland's work in The Lancet, where I think they, they said it very well, an area of study and practice focused on improving human health and achieving equity in health for all people. Um, it emphasizes transnational health issues. So global refers to the scope of the problem, not the location. And then our last piece of it, it involves many disciplines. So it's trying to cover that waterfront from the most prevention to treatment. Promotes interdisciplinary work, integrates population public health, and individual level medical care. So if you were to kind of tell the history of how we got here to global health, um, how would you contrast what we have here with what 
I just described as international health? What would be sort of the core things that shifted us into uh, really the, the late 90s when global health became a term? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It definitely doesn't have that us-them, or it's not meant to have that us-them quite as much, and that it is inclusive, like one people, one globe, one goal to improve human health. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I think it's such a good point you've made. This is sort of aspirational. It's what inside the field you wish the world would look like when we put our resources together and try to improve human health in the globe. But people are still people, and power is still power, and the same kind of tensions and self-protection without understanding the collective impact of the self-protection exists. So you're absolutely right. I don't think you can rename a field and it, the issues go away. But it's nice to have a vision up there that might be different. Yeah. Any other thoughts about this? Is Yes. Could you say it just one more time? Yes. Excellent. Exactly. So this broadens it, and in fact, I uh, feel very strongly about this here at Yale University. The disciplines that used to do it, public health and, inter and international health were medicine, public health, nursing. Yeah, sometimes you might get an economist to do a cost-effectiveness analysis, maybe. But that, that was kind of it. Um, and the idea was it's something scientific and technical that people with that background would be interested in, the microbial, the biology, all of that. Whereas this is a much broader definition to say if we're going to improve human health in the globe, we need anthropologists, we need sociologists, yes, we need physicians and nurses and public health people too, but we can't come up with something just from one discipline and assume it's actually going to make a difference. In fact, it could make things a lot worse. And so the idea you need an ecologic approach with multiple disciplines so you don't mess it up is really embedded in this. Um, and an example of that, actually I'm, it's just on my mind now because it's just happened to me, uh, you know, economists, I don't know how many of you have an economics bachelor's degree? Me too. So I'm, I can make fun of that. I can make fun of that group then. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but economists have, um, over the last five to seven years, done a lot of research to suggest that microfinancing, if you can direct microfinance loans to women in low-income settings, you can really elevate the economy. And you know the literature about women will invest the money back in the family or the community. Men don't always. I'm sorry. It's just empirically true. But um, they, so these large amount of microfinancing has begun um, and is in full force. But no one actually studied heavily what's the full impact of that. And unfortunately, the literature that's starting to come out now is that if you just do microfinancing in a very low income setting where the women have never had any wealth, the gender based violence towards the women will increase compared to the baseline. So what you thought, if you just took one perspective on health, you thought doing this would be the very best thing you could do. And who could think it wouldn't backfire? 
But if you were an anthropologist or a sociologist or a psychologist, you might have anticipated that's changing the power dynamic, that's going to create resistance. People are going to feel they don't have, but then she has it, and the whatever expresses itself with gender-based violence might get worse. And in fact, that's what the literature is saying. So now, both public health people and anthropologists working together have identified several interventions that they can do at the same time as the microfinancing, like a gender-based dialogue group, which doesn't cost a lot of money, but it makes you focus on how are we going to manage the new asset in our, con in our community. Uh, and that, with the microfinancing, seems to get all of the good things that microfinancing does, but actually mitigates the gender-based violence from where baseline was. An example of what you highlighted, that this interdisciplinary work is so important for us not to make things worse when we wanted to make things better. Yeah, so good. Yes. Yeah. That is so interesting. You need to publish that. Oh, you did. Okay. <laughs> I need to read that. <laughs> no, but it's fascinating. I probably did read it, and it's just in the back of my recesses of my brain. Yeah, but it's fascinating. And it's such a small shift. And there would be a lot of reasons, actually, that people might not want to give the coupons because they might think it's paternal, patronizing and people ought to be free to get their money. But you have to get inside the head and say, no, 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 this family's not free to begin with. It's trapped in poverty. They've got these gender-based issues. So, you know, it's, fair. it's fascinating. It's nice. Okay, so let me move on from our definitions. And now I want to talk about leadership theory. I hope, oh, I didn't make one more connection. Given the fact that global health has this complicated, you have to span the boundaries, and I don't just mean the boundaries of nations, but the boundaries of disciplines. Have you ever tried to talk to an economist about anthropologic work? You're going to do a qualitative study? No, no, no. I need the econometrics. What's your instrumental variable? I mean, that's econ. So imagine all the disciplines you have to cross to actually solve some of the problems of global health. Not easy. And you have to organize whole groups to get something done. Not easy. It really takes leadership. More leadership than international health did. More leadership than even in the days of just public health. Particularly as we are seeing health as one of many of the things a society wants to achieve. Right at the top of the strategic agenda of presidents of countries, etc. So it takes leadership. So we have to understand something about leadership. So I thought I would take you through a little bit of history of where the concepts of leadership, at least in the United States and Europe, have come from. Um, and just see if we can get ourselves to maybe why we have some of the situations we currently have. And I want to bring us back to the 1800s, um, because that is really when the scholars, at least in the United States, started to write about the term leadership. And in those days, people really thought leadership was reflected in your personal traits. You know, what you looked like, who you might be, your traits, that is what you're born with. So if you had to imagine what people way back then would have said some of those traits associated with leadership, a good leader is, what would those adjectives be? Personal traits. Tall. Loud voice. <laughs> yes. Someone's raising their hand. Yes. <laughs> Male. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right answer. Okay. Tall, loud voice. Male. Anything else? Attractive. Physically attractive. Charming. Yep. 
Courage. Okay, so courageous feels a little bit more like a behavior than a trait. I don't know. I'll get to you, though. You stay on this. Okay, so back to traits. Yeah. Well-dressed. Okay, yeah. It's, yeah. Charismatic in looks would be the trait. Yeah. I don't know why I'm looking at myself. Charismatic as, okay. <laughs> yes. Some thought it was a birthright. Yeah. So maybe the trait would be you were born into a high position. And that's a trait that you, you got born with. Yep. Eloquent. It's a little bit like a behavior, but I think you're, yeah. Tall. Yeah, we said tall. Nobody's going to say race here? No one's going to say white? Barbara, have you made these people feel comfortable and safe here yet? <laughs> By your midterm meeting, you'll be talking about that a lot. Don't worry about it. But people had in their brains tall, white, male, thin, athletic, whatever it's going to be. I put a whole list of them here. Um, attractive, you said this, and male, you said that. I guess I wasn't quite so, oh, I wasn't as racy as to put black there. But in any case, that idea was the 1800s, 213 years ago. But I want to ask you, if you've ever been in a situation where you think people actually are believing that leadership is all about your traits. Yes. Story? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And the literature on this sort of empirically is these things are not associated with better performance. They're not associated with these things. But it is still just stereotypically in our brains. And I think as younger people going to lead, you might as well just recognize whoever you're working with is sort of got that mental model a little bit in their head. They have that mental model. And it's not that you have to become that. You should never become something you are not. But knowing that is what other people might be projecting is a really good thing. I would like to say this theory of what makes a good leader is gone from the scholarship. <laughs> it is old. It is not what people actually believe now. My own personal experience is you'll run against it again, no question. Now, what happened after the 1800s, as we started to get into industrialization in the early 1900s, business schools came on the horizon. And the very early business schools thought to themselves, well, how do we teach leadership if it's a trait. And they started to think, you know, I don't think that tells you enough about the whole story. Leadership is not a trait. It's more of a set of behaviors. And that whole next generation of scholars up through the 1930s really considered leadership something that could be taught. You could go through class. You could learn the behaviors. You could master the recipe of behaviors. And you would be an excellent and effective person in the leadership role. And I'm curious, we said some of the behaviors before, like act courageously, or speak eloquently, or um, project charisma. Anything else that you imagine would go into um, leadership? Yeah. Listen well. It's a great one. Yep. Yep. Project confidence. That's great. Yep. Honesty, being honest, okay, great, and, and maybe trustworthy, uh, reliable, credible, yeah. Mm -hmm. Being hum the humble servant leader, yes, um, humility, yep. Being good at collaboration and participation, being able to get people's ideas and listen to them, up. yep, yep, here and then. Uh, accept criticism? consider criticism. You might not accept it. That's going a little far. <laughs> I'll get right to you. Yes, you, that's good. Being able to mediate, listen and then mediate. Yep. Yeah, don't let them see you sweat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yep. Decisive. These are all ones you read about. Yes. Articulate, like eloquent, articulate. Yep. What'd you say? Yes, that? Okay, good. Yes. Be resourceful. Wow, these are so many. It's so overwhelming. Can you imagine if you had to be all of these behaviors? 
Okay, so I think my list is just about the same. The only one that I think I didn't hear, and I'm sure it's there, we just didn't get to it, was optimism. Um, people will talk about this a fair amount, that people in leadership roles have to be optimistic that things will be better. Not to the degree of repressing the bad, but nonetheless, even given the current state, optimistic that it's worth working for something slightly better. Now, this theory of leadership called the behavioral theory of leadership is a much improved theory of leadership from trait theory. Just empirically, people who use these behaviors, and many of the ones that you describe, have been shown to tend to get better outcomes from groups, etc. But there are also problems with this theory. Um, now, one, and this theory is very alive and well. Um, and I think it's quite modern to reject this theory, actually. But one problem with the theory is, as I had just said, if I listed all 20 trait, uh, behaviors we just said, can anybody really do all 20 of those behaviors all the time? It's like impossible. So are you a lousy leader if you don't do those behaviors? I mean, it just seems too high a bar. And when has one person really made the whole thing change or really demonstrate. I would say a person leads and shows a leadership, plays a leadership role, but clearly they're complemented by other people who maybe make up for what the person in the leadership role might not have. So um, I should know this, but um, I'm going to forget. Who, I better not go down that road. But you know, I do this sometimes. So who's the guy in the Bible who couldn't speak? and her, got the tablets from God, you know, Moses. Thank you. Moses could not speak. <laughs> Sorry. Moses, right? Couldn't he not speak? He needed Aaron to translate. So was Moses not a strong leader? I don't know. I mean, eloquent. Uh, sorry, you missed the eloquent spot. You are not a good leader. You know, it just, it makes no sense, does it? leadership has to be in the relationship between people who are sitting in a leadership role and people who are sitting in followership roles. And it's much stronger for you to say, what role am I playing on this team? Am I in the leadership role or am I in the followership role? And both are very honorable and take tremendous skill and the relationship between that is critical. So to think that this says it all, no one person could do this and probably one person who did that would burn out very quickly if they could. So there was a hand up. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So perfect, ex perfect point because two problems here. One, no one person can do a litany of 25 different behaviors all the time. Two, these things are so culturally determined. I mean, being um, confident and having a loud voice in Ethiopia is one of the worst things you can do because a loud voice is just an insult. It's like you're screaming at the person. You know, they have a much quieter culture. And so I'm going to try to keep my voice down. Um, but this is such a critical thing that you have raised because you might come up with a completely different list and these might actually be unleadership. They may be insulting and horrific. So that's true. The behaviors themselves can't stretch over every context. So if we're doing global health, you're going to hit somewhere where these behaviors are actually just the opposite of leadership. So this gets us to where this concept of leadership is not enough either. And in fact, the, um, the scholarship in this area around the 1960s started to shift because it seemed more complex. It seemed that the same person could be very successful in leadership roles in one instance, but then fail in another circumstance. And it's as you had just said, you might be successful in one country, not another, but even within the same country. For instance, President Johnson was typically reviewed as very, very successful in the civil, the American civil rights. You know, he was extremely strategic 
to figure out how to leverage and how to make others in the communities really take responsibility for civil rights and was seen really as a mastermind of how he was able to move the South on this. And of course, coming from the South and having more understanding of Congress, etc., I think this was more in his wheelhouse to do this. And yet, very few years later, he's widely thought of by historians in the Vietnam War as really not doing such a great job. In fact, showing tremendous leadership skills for civil rights and really showing poor leadership skills in the Vietnam War. I don't know if this example brings it home to you. I was a child then, so I remember these things, but maybe there's another example that would bring it more home to you. But there are the same person could do the same behaviors in one context and they're successful, and in another context they are not. That made scholars start to say, well, what is the theory of leadership? How do you create great leaders? It can't be traits, and it's not just behaviors. And in the 1970s was born the contingency theory of leadership. And the contingency theory says what it sounds like. One's capacity for leadership depends on the situation. And the key to leadership is reading, that is understanding, assessing, reading, the human, the political, the technical, the economic, I'm sure the cultural, social environment. Because the story now is to actually be able to, if this is what leadership is, engaging others to achieve group objectives, then understanding what others' context is and what is the environment I'm living in, like an organism in uh, uh, trying to be healthy in its environment, it has to adapt. And so suddenly the ability to read your environment becomes a fundamental and central piece of what leadership is. Furthermore, if you believe that contingency theory exists, all of a sudden leadership is not really a characteristic of an individual because no individual is without their environment. And the environment, in part, determines your ability to lead. So now, leadership is a property of a whole system. It's not a property of one person. People have to collaborate to, de to be able to achieve group objectives. This has rung much truer in the literature, and nothing has really replaced it in 30, 40 years, although there have been refinements of contingency theory. This is still alive and well, and it's very central for effective global health efforts where we are constantly, can never control one piece of it ourselves, is always a collaborative effort. So does this make sense to people? Yeah? You buy it? All right. Well, we'll see. Talk to you in a year. Um, so, <laughs> so now the <coughs> major developmental goal that is an implication of the theory, <coughs> I'm done with the theory, but it, when you think about, so what's the implication for my work this year? There is a real developmental goal to go through. And that is moving from an individual-based explanation for events to a systems perspective. And I think I can best um, describe this as, uh, I have a little picture after this, but on the individual level, you could imagine two people working together, collaborating on, let's say, develop, they decide they think maternity waiting homes is the thing that we need in Sudan. And Liberia has done it, and they think they should try it in Sudan. I don't know. Um, I actually was just talking to someone about this, so it's in my head. And at the individual level, Joe and Jane, they don't really get along. They're two people who have to work on this project. They've been given a grant, or let's say one's been given a grant, and they don't really get along. And they just think it's a personality clash. Joe is, let me remember who I gave what role to here. Hang on one second. Let's say Joe is... Uh, let's say Jane is super assertive. Jane's been just really smart, cert assertive, scientific her whole life. And Joe is more like, let's feel it. I'm not sure. You know, we'll see. We'll wait and see. And they see their conflict with each other as a personality clash. That would be individual level, uh, individual level analysis. But we could step one place higher if we really believe in contingency theory and say there's a group level analysis to be done. What if Joe is a public health expert 
and knows how complicated the world is. And Jane is a physician who sees things as, I went to medical school, you know, someone comes with a cough, these are the things you do. These groups, public health practitioners and physicians, have had historical conflicts, more so in the United States than in other places, but they really have had political, social, and economic conflicts with each other that could explain the current conflict. What if it was that because Joe is from public health and Jane is from a professional physician group, they already are projecting things on each other. They're already sort of playing out what their group Ness would express. It's not just about who their personality, but they actually represent a group that has a historical conflict with the other person's group. If that were the case, solving their conflict would be much different. You'd have to really think, how am I going to use the leverage of that group orientation? Is there someone from their group who could help them convince that this was important to work in this? Or can I just convince them? So if you start to see that's another variable, it gets a little more interesting what you might do in a leadership role. Whoops, wait a minute. Uh-oh, hang on. Okay, this, uh, yeah. And then I have one more, let's see. Ah, there. And then you could go one up to the systems level. What about if you were trying to work on this thing together between Joe and Jane, but the sequestration, the budget problems, have resulted in Joe not being funded at all this year? So we've got Joe and Jane a personality clash. Joe and Jane are in different professions that have historical clashes. And now there's pressure because of something way beyond Joe and Jane that make Joe really anxious. It just lost all his funding. And you step into that situation. If you thought that all I have to do is really analyze at an individual level, you would never understand that problem. You would talk about personality, I don't like it when you do this, and you're so that way, and you'd try to, you'd kind of get into the individual level part. There'd be so much more going on to that kind of interaction that you were missing, and that actually probably will end up determining how people are going to behave. And I just, in showing this picture, for instance, there's Joe and Jane, they have the conflict, they're each part of a group, so understanding what that group is and then understanding the whole within what they're in. That is absolutely fundamental to leadership, that you go into it understanding the whole. It's just like being combining across disciplines. This is combining across levels of analysis so that, in fact, you might be able to solve a problem that expresses itself between two, between two people but doesn't reflect personality. So what do you think of this? Anybody got an example that would make sense that you've experienced or that we've read about historically that would reflect this issue of the group dynamic and the system around it rather than the individuals? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes, so there's a variable that's at the individual level, something at the group level, and something probably at the systems level. The question is how much of the overall explosion, the Y variable, is really related to the individual? And I would just argue that it's a lot smaller than we think it is, because it's so much easier for us to analyze things on an individual level. It's small, and it seems immediate, and it's physical. It's like observable right there. It's not history and yet we're so born from our history. So I think that what we've seen a lot is when you try to deal, so the individual level there is probably there. Let's say you try to resolve that on an individual level and it's not working. You might say, okay, there's something other, there's something else going on. What is the historical groups that these people belong to? Is there another way to understand the kind of conflict we might expect here? But I agree with you, it's there. I just think it's smaller than we typically think it is. Yep. What else? Yeah. Did you publish this? <laughs> okay. Okay. 
Go ahead. Sorry. I'm going to have a whole reading list from you. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly it. And so you have to wonder when you see somebody who's sort of a dictator like that, what is the system that is holding them in power? Why? I'm, I'm using your words. Okay. But when somebody is playing that kind of a leadership role, what's the system that's holding that in place? Why doesn't that change? And you've just explained it vis-a-vis -vis sort of what the historical relationships might have been and what the systems piece might have been. So that's exactly right. And if you were to sit there and try to analyze that only related to her personality, you could maybe make a little bit of impact, but not very much given the larger issues. Yep. It's a great example. Any other examples or thoughts or arguments about this? Things you don't like, things you do like? So I think almost everybody in the room, um, wherever you are placed, and Barbara can say if I'm wrong on this, in the next, um, when do you leave? Is it uh, two weeks? Huh? How fun. So in, in six weeks, you will have the experience where for the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth time, you have suggested something very obvious that should be done, and you've just gotten resistance. And you, you've tried this way, and you've tried this way, and you've tried on top and underneath, and you, you're, oh, why can't, is there any way that we could just do this slightly differently? I am sure of it. And you will get, oh, well, maybe yes, and then no, and then maybe yes, 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 no, and then no. I mean, you're gonna hit this. And what I would say to you is when that happens, it is so common to say, that person is such a pain. You know, they're, they're just difficult. You know they don't ever fill up the inkjet or whatever. But actually, it may have nothing to do with that. It really may have something to do with the history of the group that person belongs to. And we all belong to multiple groups. If you had to define your groups... You know, you would base on gender, ethnicity, maybe socioeconomic status, maybe where you went to college, maybe what your previous profession has been. You belong to myriad groups. And which one is influencing you as you interact with people? It's a complicated thing. But when you hit that place in six weeks where things just don't seem to be moving as they just seem so obvious that they should move, it may be because you're analyzing it as an individual effort. If this person just listened to me, why wouldn't they just do this? It's so much more evidence-based and logical. But it's not logical if you buy this. If you buy the fact that there's a lot more to one's decision making than just their personality or the evidence in front of them. They have a much, much longer history they're bringing to it. And all I can say there is it takes tremendous effort and tremendous, I think, insight and patience to be present as those things happen and those frustrations happen, recognizing things change really slowly and with very complex uh, shifts. And it's not about, I just need to have better leadership skills. It has to do with what leadership really is, which is engaging with others to achieve group objectives, whatever that other brings to you. And that's what I hope you'll be able to do successfully in your time ahead. We work pretty hard to think how to develop leadership capacity, and we don't really refer to it as leadership training or leadership um, skills because it's capacity to engage with other. It's not a list. I took the Briggs-Myers test and I know I need to do these five things. We don't think of leadership like that. We think of it as a capacity to engage with others um, to achieve the group objectives. And here we think of it as there's some classroom-based theoretical component, about 5%, and you've probably gotten that. There's very little that you can learn in the classroom about leadership capacity. You can also, in a classroom, 
put people through experiences that bring out these capacities or not and then analyze them. And I think that's probably 20%. You're going to get something if you have a good teacher, you're going to have, and people have done a lot of this, you're going to have some experiential cases and role plays that will help in a classroom setting. But really the truth is all of this comes from field-based work where you're there without that much support doing the very best you can and just absorbing. And if leadership is about your relationship with others, then all you can do is sit there and be wide open. Put yourself in an environment of rich detail and rich experiences, which you're all about to go to, and just be open. Open the boundaries to get it and analyze it and be patient with it because the anxiety is terrible. You think you want to get something done, but just be patient with the learning because that is where I believe you're really, really going to build the leadership capacity for everything you do in the future. Um, I can really think of no better training um, than what you're going to go to do in terms of building great, great leadership skills. So I like this picture. I'm not sure why, but I just think it's funny. <laughs> and it makes me feel like, you know, anybody can do this. You just keep walking and you happen to be in the front now, you're in the leadership role. And you got to keep a good relationship with those who are following. So I'm happy to take questions, um, but that was the whole of what I had to present to you guys and I really have enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, there's a question here, yeah. I was just going to go to it. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, it's a very good question. So the, the problem is, once you've analyzed it, what are you going to do? Because you don't have any control on all those things. Um, a couple of things. Just understanding that that's going on makes you much more patient and much more insightful about what the levers might be. So you don't have any power over there's a traditional hatred between two groups in a country. You have no power over that. But you could say, okay, so that is actually why we're in conflict. And how do I attenuate this conflict? Usually people will listen a lot better to someone from the group they come from. So can you start to network with people not as close to you in the problem, but still part of the group that person is from? Then get the message through them. And so that's a different tactic you might use. So I don't think we try to study this so that we can change those other things, but more that our strategies can be a little more clever given we've got a different model of what's causing the problem. Yeah, so I hope that's helpful. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very good. So I think as you've put it very well, they are roles. It's not like she's a leader and she's not, but she's playing the leadership role. She's playing the management role. And you can have different hats. The same person could have a different hat. So even with a management team, if you are dubbed the person who's going to be in the leadership role, then your obligations to perform that role would really try to be to engage with that full management team and understand what the group objective might be and help them achieve that group objective. An hour later, you might be playing a management hat. 
And now someone has told you, we're going to do this. Can you go be sure everybody fills out the form the way they're supposed to? And then you'd be playing a management role. I think more complex than the challenge you just put forward is going to be the challenge of stepping into a leadership role for a temporary time as a new person. And, but I'm hopeful that if you take to heart this idea that it's about engaging with others to help them approve, uh, achieve these group objectives, it isn't like I'm on top and I'm telling you what to do. So all of a sudden you are very able to play that role because any of us could play that role if we're open and we're able to communicate, um, whether the other people are managerial or not. Does that help or answer your question at all? Or do you have something else in your mind? Yeah. Which, yeah. Yeah, and actually, I, why did I ask you that too? I asked you that and then I didn't go down that road because I didn't see so much bias in the audience. But usually people who are older, I think, you know, none of them want to be managers. They're all, no, 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 I'm the leader. Not understanding that it's not you're on top telling everyone what to do. So you didn't kind of fall into the trap I would have <laughs> worked on with you if anybody had done that. You're about half and half management and leadership. Yeah. Any other? Probably have time for, yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Sure. So the question is conviction and motivation. We didn't really talk about those two characteristics, behaviors, uh, but they may be most important to leadership. How might we think about this? A uh, couple things. I would always ask the question, what's the motivation for? And so if the motivation is for this end game that you've already predefined, absent all the stakeholders and people in followership roles, you are just hell bent on, we are making maternity homes. I would not call that a good leadership trait. You may ultimately get a lot done short term, but long term, if that's not what people really want, it's just going to be a pyrrhic victory and you're going to fall back to they're going to fall apart. There'll be sabotage and other things. So, but if the motivation is motivation to truly understand what others and people, particularly in followership roles, want, can achieve, prefer to achieve, that, I think, is a huge leadership trait because it's almost like the, uh, the capacity to engage with others, being motivated, interested, curious, open to engage with others. Then I would put that as absolutely, you can't have too much of that if it's that. Yeah. So. Good. Well, I think I need to go, but it's so, I want to like take this moment and just, ah, oh, you're in Brantford and you're doing global health. <laughs> Barbara, thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you all.